I'll call this meeting to order. Please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. For those of you who could hear the echo, uh, Councillor Ray is on the phone with us, so he is present, and, and we have all our council uh, here and present. Um, first order of business is a proclamation. Is there anybody here for the New Mexico Hunger Week? Uh, please come and join me up at the podium. I know it's short, but... Whereas nationwide, New Mexico has one of the highest rates of overall food insecurity of all residents, including children, veterans, the homeless, and seniors, and annual feeding America statistics rank New Mexico as one of the most food insecure states for children in the nation, and 40,000 New Mexicans seek food assistance each week. And whereas 40% of New Mexicans who receive food assistance are children under the age of 18, while 7% of those children are under the age of 5, and 13% of people who seek food assistance are senior citizens. And whereas it is a myth that people who need food assistance are homeless or out of work, when in reality only 8% of people seeking assistance are homeless, and 32% of households seeking emergency food assistance include at least one employed adult. And whereas, while thousands of New Mexicans receive assistance through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the funding only provides for less than three weeks of groceries, and New Mexicans face difficult choices between paying for food and paying for utilities, rent, or mortgage, medicine or medical care, and transportation. And whereas there is an urgent need to address New Mexico's food insecurity and to eliminate hunger in New Mexico, and a hunger summit coordinated and sponsored by the North Central New Mexico Economic Development District and the, the, non, the non-metro area agency on aging will be held on July 17th through the 18th, 2014 at the Isleta Resort and Casino in Albuquerque to address these issues. And whereas statewide participation is expected to include federal and state agencies, local, local governments, nonprofit agencies, food banks, faith-based organizations, and other entities that are addressing hunger issues in New Mexico. Now, therefore, on behalf of the town of Silver City, Council, I, Michael S. Moronis, Mayor of the town of Silver City, Grant County, New Mexico, hereby proclaim July 14th through the 18th, 2014, as New Mexico Hunger Week. Thank you. You pretty much mentioned how I was going to mention some of the statistics. Um, as mentioned in the proclamation, that New Mexico is one of the highest states facing food security, insecurity at 21.2%. And our office, I'm um, Pam with the Council of Governments, and our office will be represented at the um, Food Hunger Summit that, that was mentioned in the proclamation. So we will be there. Perfect. Thank you. This is Next item on the agenda is public input. We have a, well, most of the people on our uh, public input sheet are in reference to an ordinance that we will be discussing in unfinished business. Um, I'm going to have you wait until we go to the ordinance and have you speak um, at that time and it'll, it'll just flow better. Um, outside of that, we have uh, Lisa, who is also on the agenda, 
So the only public input not on the agenda is Lucy Whitmarsh with the Main Street Program. And I'll remind you, you, you have five minutes to speak, and I'll warn you when you come to a minute. I'll get a Hi. Please uh, hit the red button. Um, I'm Lucy Whitmarsh, and I'm president of the board for the Silver City Main Street. And I'd like to let you know that our board of directors has selected a new manager, and it's Tim Brown. And he would, Tim Brown, and um, he would like to say a few words to you. Uh, Your Honor, um, my name is Timothy Brown. I uh, uh, came here from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Uh, I was a member of the Board of Directors and a, a former Planning and Zoning Commissioner. Uh, I'm a licensed architect in Arizona, and uh, I've uh, really been very excited to be involved with Main Street, New Mexico. I'm very impressed with the program and look forward to implement, helping to implement the program to the town of Silver City. Uh, I, I really am quite impressed with Silver City. Uh, I came here in January and worked as the interim uh, curator of exhibits for the Silver City Museum, and it was kind of an immersion into uh, the culture and getting into some of the details of the town. So it's uh, I really look forward to working with all of you, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome. Thank you. And I also did want to announce an event um, on July 19th, which is a Saturday, from 9 to 1. We're going to be having the third annual Big Ditch Day, and that event is going to be in the Big Ditch Park, uh, which runs from where the farmer's market is in the Main Street Plaza um, to um, the events are going to be from there to the Pedestrian Street Bridge um, at um, that runs from Market Street and it's to encourage our community to come out and enjoy one of our resources um, that is very unique to our community um, which is the Big Ditch and we really want to celebrate that so I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is council comments. Uh, Councilor Bettison. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as a member of the Town Council of Silver City, which represents one third of the, of the County Commission constituency, I want to state my concern and opposition to the Grant County Commission's intent to adopt a county hold harmless gross receipts tax of three eighths percent at its regular meeting scheduled for this Thursday, July 10th. The Town Council has openly discussed over the past year the unintended consequences and impacts of HB 641, the Omnibus Tax Bill, on the Town of Silver City that was passed by the New Mexico Legislature and signed into law by Governor Martinez in 2013. I have personally mentioned during Council comments and in budget discussions the fact that the Town of Silver City is over the 10,000 population threshold and that it is one of the 12 municipalities out of 105 in the New Mexico Municipal League that will not be made whole by the imposition of the 3 eighths of 1% GRT provided to municipalities and counties to recover the revenue loss over the 15 year repeal of the Hold Harmless, which begins her legislation this July. HB 641 states that municipalities under 10,000 population threshold and counties under 40,000 threshold will retain their hold harmless payments. But municipalities and counties over these thresholds only have one option for recovering revenue loss, the imposition of a 3 eighths of 1% tax to council action in one eighth, in one eighth increments or you know the full 3 eighths or 2 eighths. As I mentioned, HB 641 has several unintended consequences. One flaw enables municipalities and counties under the stated thresholds the option to continue to receive their hold harmless payments, their current distributions, or to choose to impose the three eighths of 1% tax. Another fatal flaw is that the imposition of the three eighths of 1% for counties 
is not restricted to unincorporated areas, but also includes the municipalities, like Silver City. What do these flaws mean for you and for all of us across the state, and of course here in our own municipality, and what do state legislators think? The under threshold municipalities and counties, and even those over threshold, with the exception of the 12 municipalities of which Silver City is one, would actually be able to benefit by receiving more funding than they currently receive in hold harmless payments. So despite what we can do, which I'll explain a little bit further, we will still be in arrears. We will still be at annual losses, considerable annual losses. Whereas those municipalities that, and, and counties with thresholds that are under threshold, they'll maintain their, their whole harmless payments. They, you know, if they do an option to actually um, take the three eights, they're actually going to be making money, okay? So they would be making money at the expense of their constituents. State legislators and authors of the amended legislation, of, of the attempted amended legislation, well, the HB 641 is the result of amended legislation, I should state, have repeatedly stated that the intent of HB 641 was not for municipalities and counties to make money, to increase revenue, but to be made whole by the three-eighths of one percent. Remember, as I said before, Silver City will not be made whole. The imposition of the three-eighths or any one-eighth increment thereof by the county, Grand County, given the second flaw, means that some counties, including some that have already enacted them, will compound or increase the tax rates of the municipalities like Silver City that will not be made whole only within, and these increases only exist within town limits. So they will be able to make, once again, money on this, increased revenues far and above the um, current distributions. Once these and several other flaws were pointed out leg to legislators by the New Mexico Municipal League Executive Director Bill Fulginetti, which I stated, um, the former mayor stated, and a number of us have talked about this, including um, Mr. Brown, several fixes were proposed last year, but were dead in the water. Nothing came to fruition. However, state legislators did state repeatedly over and over again that the intent was not for municipalities and counties to make money off of this provision of the ability to impose three-eighths or to take the option. They were not supposed to make money and that any municipality and county, and there have been several on both sides, that impose this will find that there'll be legislation that will be proposed for 2015 that will repeal the enactment of the three-eighths if they're making money. So it's, I mean, I mean, we can go all the way back and say to the first thing is that the food tax was something that was originally done by municipalities years ago, and it was taken away and it was repealed under Governor Richardson, and that's when the whole harmless provision began. It's something we've talked about several times. I also want to make sure everybody understands that the food tax only applied to people that were not on EBT. Those individuals, the food stamps slash EBT cards, only pay the food tax when they overextended their allotment. They did not pay it. So I think um, I've understood that somewhere for a family of four that you can run out over your allotment in, a, in about, about a half a month. Yeah. Yeah, a half a month, three weeks. And then you would have to pick up the tax. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that is not a regressive tax except for when they go over because they are not taxed in. The three-eighths of 1% that we were given the option to do in HB 641 is a regressive tax. It goes on everything but food that you purchase. And I mean everything but food. So the reality is, is that 
our low income folks don't have an out to not pay that tax. So why the opposition to Grant County's adoption of a whole farmers GRT 1% um, and one-eighth or even the three-eighths proposed in their legislation. Well, currently, because the population of Grant County is under 30K, they get to keep their annual distributions, which I understand from the former town manager, are 350000 They They don't have to do anything. It's not facing a reduction in whole harmless because it's under the 40,000 population threshold. With the three-eighths, HHGRT, Grant County will bring in an estimated amount of $1.97 million. That is $1.4 million over their current whole harmless distribution. The tax rate in Silver City will increase three eighths, which I think is, is it 0 0.0, 0.325 or some five, some five. Apparently I'm not good at math. Um, now, when you consider that the town council has been very forthcoming, very transparent since last year, and even before that, when and back in 2010, in February 2010, when I put forward a resolution that basically stated that we were in opposition to the repealing of the whole harmless because of what we knew it meant to us. Um, so when you consider all that, and we've been very forthcoming regarding the impacts to our coffers, let me just kind of tell you. Currently the town receives, and this was presented by a town manager at the May 13th um, regular meeting, um, and it was about the budget, or was a special meeting. The town receives $1.7 in whole harmless GRT annual payments, or what is 18% of the town's total gross receipts tax which would mean a recurring loss each year to the town's coffers of $1.7 million if we don't take any mitigating action. If we adopt the full three eighths, which we must because of the revenue loss of $1.7 million, imagine what would have to be cut. The revenues will only be $1.1 million, leaving $600,000 in annual deficit to the town which is cutting services. There's no way for us to make those funds. We have also been very, very transparent and forthcoming about the actions that we have begun to take to mitigate the effects of this loss. And they've been relatively simple and, and, and clearly discussed in the budget meeting. The town manager uh, in this year's budget made sure that enterprise funds like the water fund pay for itself by making sure that every expense, whether it's debt or uh, maintenance or employees, that that all comes underneath that enterprise fund, that it's actually listed that way so that we know what each one of our funds cost. So the enterprise fund, as we've explained in the past and I've mentioned um, during our meetings, is one where um, individuals like the water pay for the water they use that goes into the account and that is what is directly expended. There is no reserve, although we would like one in the instance of something happening. And there isn't some excess wealth of money. An enterprise fund is basically what comes in is what goes out. We also, this, um, um, as everybody well knows who lives in town, we removed the GRT, the gross receipts tax, that subsidized the water fund, which led to increasing water rates, ensuring that our residents and those that out-of-town residents that use our water are paying for what they're using. So I just want to backtrack for a minute and say over 10 years that the, GR, the GRT that we removed um, has over 10 years, we've used $6.4 million in gross receipts tax to subsidize the water fund, which is equivalent to, I believe, 23%, 21% of the water fund. So you, we were subsidized the, that cost. So we've done those two fixes. That's all we have done. We have stated in no uncertain terms 
that this council and this town, does, we do not tax our residents and others more than what is needed to cover the cost of services. Thus, while the whole premise Rose receipts tax repeal will begin to impact us on July 1st, we have yet to adopt even one-eighth of the three-eighths GRT because it is not necessary at this time. We have also stated that when it becomes necessary, we will adopt the final one-fourth of the local option GRT, infrastructure GRT available to us by council action. But, and I want to state this because this is something we've kind of stated in a roundabout way. If HB 641 stands and is not corrected, even with the adoption of the three eights provided by HB 641 and the one uh, fourth infrastructure GRT local, op local option tax, the town is projected to run a deficit of $345,000 annually due to increases in um, infrastructure and regulatory issues, if I remember correctly. That means that we, your town council, have to somehow figure out a way to continue to provide you with the services that you are getting right now while dealing with a loss of $345,000. So hopefully you can all see where I'm going with this. Plus, when we enact if HB 641 is not corrected as we hope it will be, plus when we enact our three eighths and the one fourth and add the county's money making three eighths, the tax rate for the city is going to go up one full percent from seven point. 325 to 8.325. So ultimately, my opposition to the Grant County adoption is simple. They are taking advantage of poorly written legislation to make revenues greatly exceeding their current whole harmless distribution at the expense of Grant County residents that shop in Silver City and its and town and at the expense of the town. So I just want to make a few things just really clear. There's no assurance that there'll be a legislative fix to HB 641. Um, you've heard me mention that the municipal league is moving forward on that. You've heard town manager mention that. I sit on the board of directors for the New Mexico Municipal League. I'm very vocal about the fact that the town of Silver City is one of the 12 municipalities that will hurt, that will, that will not recover from this. So, and I also want to reassure you that the town will not move forward to adopt, at least I won't, um, to adopt any taxes that we have the option of adopting until it's absolutely necessary to do so. So one of the things that was mentioned this morning at the county um, work session was that uh, this is because there's a potential threat to what's called PILT or payment in lieu of taxes, which is where they get funding for federal lands that are not taxed from the federal government. PILT was made mandatory, authorization was made mandatory, meaning whatever was requested was authorized in 2008 through 2012 through legislation they also reauthorized it mandatory for in 2013, 2014, and I believe in 2015 after what I did in my research. There is widespread support from both sides of the aisle. Democrats and Republicans support continuing PILT. There is no imminent danger except for the fact that it has to be included in the budget. And it has been included in the proposed budget by the president, um, stating very specifically that this is necessary to our small counties that have huge tracts of federal properties that don't receive any income, uh, any taxes, that they can't gain tax from. So it's not necessarily imminent. I, it's, it, it appears clearly from everything that Various different legislators on both sides I have on their websites 
that this will continue. But right now, there's been no impact to Grant County. Yet, when this is adopted, which is the potential of being done on Thursday at a public hearing where your voices can be heard, it will be enacted beginning January 1st of 2015. So, so DRT, Grocery Seeds Tax in the Town of Silver City, will go up beginning January 1st if this, if this is adopted. So I just wanted to clearly state my opposition. I hope that um, you understand where I'm coming from. Um, and I ask you that if you are not sure about some of the things that I've said, more than happy to provide you with the material that's been provided to the council that was shown um, uh, at the May 13th uh, budget meeting that was presented by um, the town manager. Exactly what's gonna happen to the town and have you consider the impact to your pocketbook and the fact that they will be making quite a bit of excess money, whereas all we're trying to do is ensure that we survive and provide you with the services that we we have. So that's it. That's I'm off my soapbox now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So I just want to... Uh, I think reiterate a little bit, which is that if the county does impose this increase in taxes, they will be making a lot more money, and none of it comes to Silver City. No, they can. You know, they can use it however they would. Um, so, I I think that's a really uh, good discourse. Thank you. I want to point out that there's a box near the uh, front with some free uh, reusable bags in it. Thank you. Councilor Connor. Thank you, Pam. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is just address why I did not stand up during the Pledge of Allegiance. I know that people are going to see that on caps and think I'm a horrible person. I'm really not. Uh, two and a half weeks ago, I had extensive foot surgery, and my doctor does not allow me to stand up at this point. So I won't be doing that for probably a couple of months. Um, I'm still saying the pledge, but I, I'm not able to stand. Um, that's also why we now have a list behind uh, Councilor Bettison. Um, the other thing is I would like to thank the county and CAPS because they both, both entities worked really hard to get that done before I came back from my surgery. Um, and I also would just like to thank everyone in my district that has been reaching out and giving me information, um, their concerns and their thoughts regarding the bag issue. I know we're going to hear some more tonight, but I really, really appreciate that. And I would just encourage everyone in my district to continue to send emails and call and stop me at Walmart and all the fun things they've been doing. Thank you. Councilor Ray. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say real quick, like that. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Benson, for your comments. It was well deserved, and the people need to know. Also, Mayor, I am not leaving you alone. I am here with uh, with you, <laughs> and hopefully, some people understand that. <laughs> um, hot weather. Be careful. Watch out for the other drivers, especially the kids downtown on the skateboard. And I got one thing also to, to add right here. Um, Mr. Brown gave me some figures here on on um, the swimming pool expenditures. And I would like for the people to know also that we go, the city goes out of their way to have certain things done for, for, for kids. And this swimming pool here is a money losing thing. But we're, but we're going for the kids. Our expenditures for the swimming pool will be about $82,000. The revenue, about $28,000. And I would like for people to know that, that we are doing things for the kids. And also the 4th of July parade. Thank you all who participated. We had a lot of out of town people. The, the golf park was full of people. Cruise Bishop is full of people, and downtown is full of people. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I will just add a, a, a quick thank you to uh, Mrs. Robinson, the intern, uh, intern manager for the county. Uh, when, when it was requested to put in a, a lift, uh, she was very prompt and, and uh, very accommodating to, to help us out, and, and we and the timing to, to get it done in the manner that she did to, to help out Councillor Cano is 
is uh, commendable. I, I'm really happy that the county acted in the, the manner they did. Uh, outside of that, I have no further comments. Uh, anybody need round two? No, sir. Next item on the agenda is changes to the agenda. Mm -hmm. Councilor Amon Smith? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we move up new business ahead of unfinished business. We have bond council with us tonight who came and from Albuquerque needs to go back. So I'd like to move that we have that small change in the agenda. It should not take a whole lot of time to do the new business. It would be both items A and B under new business to move in front of unfinished business. Mr. Mayor, I second the motion. Just we have a motion and a second to change the agenda to move new business ahead of unfinished business. Um, any further discussion? Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, the, the new business should be pretty quick in, in relation to that unfinished business and if we can allow our council to to get back in their vehicles and, and have a relatively early drive back, uh, I think it would be a good thing. Uh, we have a motion and a second to move new business ahead of unfinished business. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Uh, Council Bedson. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve the minutes of the regular town council meeting of June 17th, 2014. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second to approve the, the minutes of the regular meeting on June 17th, 2014. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Next item on the agenda is reports. Uh, first report is from Lisa Jimenez, manager of the nonprofit resource group, uh, who will be reporting on the activities to date on behalf of local nonprofit organizations. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening. And I'm going to try and face both directions here at the same time. We'll see how that works. Um, uh, good evening. My name is Lisa Jimenez. Um, I am with the National Center for Frontier Communities. Can you all hear me okay back there? Okay, great. Okay. Um, uh, the National Center for Frontier Communities is a national advocacy organization which advocates on behalf of rural and frontier communities. Um, and I'm here tonight to speak specifically about a program of NCFC called the Nonprofit Resource Group. Um, but first, just so people know where to find us, the National Center for Frontier Communities is actually um, administered by the Center for Health Innovation, a division of HMS. It's all very convoluted. But you can find us at 902 Santa Rita. So that's Santa Rita and College, and that's where the um, National Center for Frontier Communities is based. Um, I can't, I'm going to report tonight on our activities for the first six months of this year, June, uh, through June 30. Now, we've been super busy. I can't possibly um, talk about everything that we've been doing, but I will try and hit the highlights. Um, and I will be providing a more detailed written report to the council and to uh, Manager Brown uh, tomorrow. Okay? Um, so before I talk about our, those activities and accomplishments over the last six months, I'd like to first just explain a little bit about we, what we do, because I think there's a lot of people who don't, uh, aren't familiar necessarily with the nonprofit resource group and the services that we provide. Um, it's been a year since we transitioned from the Wellness Coalition to uh, NCFC. Um, and... Um, I kind of like to think of us as sort of a hybrid organization. We're, on the one hand, a green chamber of commerce combined with a consulting firm to nonprofit organizations, as well as community organizations and community coalitions. Um, and I know all of you are well aware that nonprofits, particularly in rural communities, are, you know, they're kind of like small businesses in that. 
people have a passion about a particular idea, their mission, some of you know products, services that they want to bring to the marketplace. And particularly in rural communities, nonprofit management, you know, they're really generalists. They can't possibly, you know, um, they don't have dedicated staff to write grants. They don't have dedicated marketing staff. And that's where we come in. We come in and we fill in those skill gaps and provide those consulting services at very affordable rates. Um, so some of our key services, um, we provide an annual survey of nonprofits. And um, that, you know, essentially is a snapshot of the nonprofit community at that moment in time. The last one we did was in November 2013. We had 52 responses. Thank you, nonprofits out there who uh, responded to that. And um, so, what you know, we essentially ask nonprofits what is on their mind, what their uh, primary concerns are at, at that time. And we use the information. We ask very specific questions about training um, and capacity building needs. And so, and then we use that information to tailor our workshops and trainings for, for the year. Um, curbside consulting, I know everybody is familiar with that. It's one of our more popular services. We provide that every Wednesday morning at our offices, again, 902 Santa Rita Street, 9 to noon every Wednesday. That's a free service. People can just walk in and uh, any nonprofit issue, we're there to help. Um, and if that isn't convenient, we also, you know, we do consulting by telephone. We set up appointments, and we also do long-distance uh, consulting as well. Um, what else about consulting? Um, curbside consulting, I think that's it. The heart of the services that we provide, we, we refer to as our strategic consulting services. This is, um, and we provide this, you know, not only again to nonprofit organizations, but also community coalitions as well. This process begins with a free capacity assessment, um, and, and I can't get into the details of that because it, uh, it'll be just too wonky, but I do have, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about uh, those uh, particular um, uh, assessments. But it, just in a nutshell, the NOCA stands for Nonprofit Organizational Capacity Assessment, and the sister uh, uh, assessment for coalitions we refer to as the COCA. This is a, let me just talk about the NOCA real briefly. It's a facilitated process. You know, there's other capacity assessments available, particularly online, um, but they generally cost between $200 and $1,000 a piece. Um, and we find that that facilitated process with key leadership and staff of the nonprofit organization is um, in and of itself a capacity building opportunity because nonprofits have a moment in time, it takes about 90 minutes, uh, where they can actually, you know, leave their office and come together and talk about what is the state of their particular organization. So it's a really great process. No plastic here, just aluminum. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, so everything starts with that capacity assessment. And what that does, it provides us with um, a roadmap, if you will. It identifies an organization's specific capacities as well as those areas in need of improvement. And that begins the whole process of that strategic consulting work. And this work um, is done over a period of time. Um, we create a findings and recommendations report. We work with the client and then match them up with consultants from our consultant community of uh, practice. That is a 22-member group of professional consultants with a very wide um, array of skills and expertise, so everything from financial management, organizational development, research evaluation, uh, you know, grant writing, resource development, um, whatever it is, you know, we can help nonprofits address their particular um, capacity gaps. And this particular area, again, this is where the support of the town of Silver City is so, so very important. Because the way this works, we are able to provide these services on a sliding fee scale. 
from just $20 an hour up to $40 an hour, and we base that on the organization's budget. And the way it works, um, you know, any nonprofit will tell you they can't afford full market consulting rates. It's just not possible. So the, the funds from the town of Silver City, um, it create, it's a, essentially an underwriting pool that subsidizes those services so that our nonprofits are able to access that. Um, and then once we the work is complete, we do a post, what we call a post assessment, just to make sure that the work that we've done has been effective and that there have been, uh, the, that the capacity needs have been addressed. Um, we also provide workshops, trainings, and networking opportunities, um, free online resources, and of course we, not, we advocate on behalf of the nonprofit sector more broadly. Um, particularly, many of you heard me have heard me talk about the importance of the nonprofit sector in terms of economic development. Without the key services that nonprofits provide to this community and others, um, you know, who is going, who's going to want to bring a business? to a community where there are, there's, uh, there are not you know, services for seniors, uh, for victims of domestic violence, um, arts and cultural opportunities, environmental protection, all, all of those, the many, many services that we depend on our nonprofits to uh, provide to our communities. Now, I know we're getting short on time, so I want to just talk quickly about some of the key highlights over the past six months. I mentioned the survey um, that was completed. We'll be doing another one again in the fall. Um, we organized in March the very first Southwestern New Mexico Regional Nonprofit Conference. Um, it was very successful, for, particularly for the, uh, the first time of uh, the first event. Um, and we organized that in partnership with the Grant County Community Health Council. Um, the Gospel Mission and Silver Sexual Assault Services um, organizers. Uh, we're hoping to have several more organizers this year. Um, we're going to be meeting on uh, July 30th to start planning the 2015 event. Mayor Moronis was gracious enough to provide the welcome there along with Senator Morales. Um, we provided 11 workshops. Participants gave us some very, very positive feedback. Um, it was a great network, networking opportunity. And, um, you know, we also look at this event as an economic development opportunity for the community in that we're, um, you know, this is a regional event. Now, last year, or I'm sorry, this year, um, we had primarily participants from Grant and Luna counties, but we also uh, brought in some folks from Catherine and Sierra counties as well, and we're hoping to expand that in 2015. Um, I think that's it on the conference. It was it was a really good event, and um, we're looking forward to uh, many nonprofits supporting us in that effort again next year. Um, Give Grande, we've all heard about that. We were um, involved in the organization of that, as well as promoting the event for nonprofits, which that event raised almost fifty-seven thousand dollars for nonprofits, uh, the forty that participated. Uh, we also assisted the United Way of Southwestern New Mexico to uh, review Grant County proposals and make recommendations to their board of directors for funding. Um, curbside consulting, I mentioned, um, in the last six months we've provided 49 consulting um, consultations uh, during that period. Um, and then with regard to the strategic consulting services, um, our current clients right now are Guadalupe Montessori School. They completed their capacity assessment in March, and right now we are providing assistance to them as they um, go through their leadership transition there. Um, we've provided uh, 60, almost 70 hours of assistance to Guadalupe to date. We are also working with them uh, to, um, we're assisting them with their financial management and QuickBooks training to some new staff there. Uh, we're also working with LifeQuest, and LifeQuest has been um, an ongoing uh, client for, uh, of ours, and um, Evangeline Zamora, uh, one of our greatest supporters, um, she credits us with creating a strong 
business model that will serve clients well into the future. And currently, we are providing resource development assistance to them, grant writing, um, and uh, strategic marketing capacity building services, uh, and have provided 46 hours of consulting service to LifeQuest. And then finally, Literacy Link Lyamos, um, we have a new manager on board, who Mary Beth just started last week. We're very excited to have her here in the community from Albuquerque, and she is going, they're going to be uh, creating a new website with our uh, services. Um, and then uh, the last thing I just, you know, while we're doing this, of course, we're building our own internal capacity. You know, we are still a very young organization. And, um, you know, we, Susan, between myself and Susan Wilger, who is the program director for NCFC, um, we've written seven funding proposals. Three of those uh, have been funded, and we're waiting on the other four. We have our fingers crossed and our toes. Um, we're also in the process of uh, creating our um, our own uh, business plan right now, a strategic plan, and um, of course, there's the ongoing management of the consultant community of practice. So, with that, those are kind of the key highlights. I'll be happy to answer any questions, and I do have a full uh, written report for you. Okay, so thank you. Any questions for Council, Council Besson? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I actually don't have a question. I have a comment. Um, in my capacity as the WMU Museum Director, um, I did go to curbside consulting, and I want to publicly say that I really appreciate um, the feedback that we were given on a grant that we successfully were awarded. So um, I, if you have an opportunity to use those uh, the, the, the curbside consulting, I would really encourage you to do so. Um, Lisa is a wonderful person to bounce ideas off of and to actually point out if there's any flaws or any issues that you need, may need to adjust in something like a grant. So I just really want to thank her again. And, and I think that you also participated in providing the information uh, to those individuals looking to uh, or seeking to get um, the nonprofits seeking to get a community investment fund grant. You were the one that helped do that last year, um, and I know that that sort of thing will be held again yeah. this year, which is a very informative session if you're seeking to to try to get funding for your uh, entity that's nonprofit. Um, from uh, Freeport McMoran um, Copper and Gold Foundation um, Community Investment Fund, really encourage you to go to um, the great workshop that, that uh, Lisa and um, who is Stephanie? We, we provided that last call. Provided that last with call. The health council. So, um, just kudos to everything you're doing, and I really appreciate uh, you guys, and of course, the Center for Health Innovation for housing you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that endorsement. And um, I wanted to mention, too, we do have a new website and on, lots of online uh, resources for free for nonprofits there. We have a brochure. And I will soon be meeting with um, our local nonprofits to find out what they need, to learn more about their specific needs, and uh, to educate them specifically about the services that we do offer. If you'd like a brochure, I'd be happy to give you one. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Brown? Uh, Chief? Any other reports? Chief? Okay. Well, we got some good news. We're getting some rain now. <laughs> so, um, this week, the Gila National Forest has lifted the restrictions on the forest, lifted their low stage one restrictions. They went into effect this morning at 8 o'clock. The county is looking at lifting their restrictions this week, I believe at their Thursday meeting. Um, we've gathered some data working with the Forest Service and stuff, and right now the National Weather Service is reporting that the monsoon is currently following an El Nino pattern. It's uh, where daily monsoon activity should be expected with the high chances of flooding in the southern area, especially the Gila, because of the recent fires they've had up there. Um, southwest New Mexico is under what they're calling a very well-established moisture plume. The dew points are up in the mid-50s. The relative humidity is following suit up into the 30s, which for some of us we don't like, but because we're, you know, dry desert lizards. But the uh, 
humidity, relative humidity is up in 30 percent. Uh, the Gila South area, as we look at it, things called ERCs or energy release components, uh, in 2011 when we were having all the major fires going, our ERCs were up in the 97 percentile. This year we've been running anywhere between 90 and 97, just kind of touching the 97s. Uh, now they're all the way down into the 58 to 59 percentiles. Uh, the winds are becoming more calm and they're only expected on the thunderstorms. When the thunderstorms are blowing in, the cells are coming in. And we are no longer meeting any criteria for the red flag warnings. So because of that, I think Silver State Fire Department is going to lift our restrictions. We're still going to, we're going to open the permitted burning, come in, get a permit, stuff like that. We'll put out a news release through uh, and here tomorrow. So if you guys have any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other staff reports? Still there, Councillor? Councillor Ray? I think he did get something. Be ready for a recess. Yeah. Councilor Bettison. Mr. Mayor, I move for a short recess while I'm with the Councilor We have a motion and a second for a short recess. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I call this meeting back to order. Um, We'll be moving into new business. Item A, approval, disapproval of resolution number 2014-23 relating to the Town of Silver City, New Mexico gross receipts tax improvement revenue bond series 2014 establishing the exact aggregate principal amount of the bonds of $1.5 million maturity dates rates of interest, redemption features, and price with respect to such bonds in accordance with Town Ordinance Number 1228 adopted on June 9, 2014, approving documents related to the bonds and ratifying action previously taken in connection therewith. Councilor? Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. First of all, thank you all for moving me up. Much appreciated and uh, very thoughtful of you. Uh, this is all good news. This is uh, follows up on the meeting last month uh, about the, the bond ordinance and what that did was authorize the issuance of the bonds in a maximum amount of $1,500,000 in two series, a taxable series and a tax exempt series uh, with the understanding that we'd be back with actual pricing information after George K. Baum and Mr. Valenzuela had lined up a purchaser and got the best bids and the like. Um, and so that's where we are. And uh, what this resolution does, it does authorize the two series of bonds, and I provided you the most up-to-date draft, which shows the, the par amount of 1150000 which, of course, is less than $1,500,000 as the parameter, uh, breaks it down into a $650,000 tax-exempt issuance and a $500,000 taxable issuance. And the reason, again, for that, differentiation is that some of these projects have some private use or potential private use that the IRS uh, prohibits in using tax-exempt bonds, which are historically and fundamentally for governmental purposes uh, to get that uh, tax break for holders of those bonds. So uh, Mr. Brown and Mr. Valenzuela and the staff worked on determining what projects fit where and then sized it accordingly uh, with the 650 in tax-exempt, $600,000 uh, in taxable. Uh, the lender for the transaction is NBH Capital Finance, which is uh, we've worked with before and, and uh, is active in the private placements, which are becoming very common and definitely on the uptick in the last couple of years and appear to be heading that way and for municipal finance, uh, where you have just private banks holding this paper. Uh, so they have come in and uh, Offer to buy the what are termed notes here, and that's the uh, uh, same as a bond, basically just a debt obligation. And if you look on page two, uh, it starts with 2A showing what the tax exempt rates are. So the maturities are June 1, 2018 through June 1, 2024, and it shows the amounts maturing, and then a flat interest rate for all those maturities at 3.16%, which again are we're at historic lows, and so it's a very good time to be trying to tackle some capital projects through lending 
uh, to, to maximize those rates uh, and time value of your money. Uh, on 2B on page 3, it shows the taxable rates, 3.69%. And again, the higher rates there, the holders of those bonds um, uh, are taxed on the income. Do you have a question on that? Briefly, yeah. Council um, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in front of us, we have the, the series 21, 2014A as a tax rate of 3.17, and the series 21, 2014B is 3.62%, yeah. which is different from the numbers right. that you just the, stated. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. The version I handed to you or left on your desk uh, oh. before the meeting has some new rates. What, it, what happens is that the okay. uh, NBH Finance came in last week and said, okay, if, the, if we were closing it today, here's what the rates were, and we'll set the final rates today, which they did, which are locked for two weeks uh, and will close within that time. So the tax exempt went down, and the taxable went up seven basis points. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the document, just to, to highlight a few things, if you turn over to page four, uh, there is a blank there. Let me quickly highlight what this is on the optional redemption under 4D. What this relates to is when you can prepay the, the notes. And the good news is you can do that at any time. Uh, many times in the public marketing of debt, you would have a call protection that you couldn't pay them off within maybe a five or a ten year period. Here they're prepayable at any time. However, uh, which is a common practice for these private placements in banks, if you do do that, um, they need to be made whole based on what their expectations were for the note. And so there's the formula in here which basically determines if they were how they get to be made whole at the end of that based on the prepayment. And it may be zero depending on what the market is. So if they're making more money with what they've invested and how this calculation works, it, it may have zero penalties. So you have the option to prepay it if you want to do it. Again, these rates are so low that likely that you would not. And given the short term of the debt, it's likely that you would not. The one thing I would add, I misunderstood in my conversations with the lender, if you look under the second paragraph under D, there is that blank with the percentage sign. Mm -hmm. I was understanding he was going to provide that for today's meeting. Actually, that gets uh, provided at closing. So what I would say is just an amendment to say a spread uh, in, and then delete a blank percentage. A spread in effect at the time of prepayment is determined by purchaser as identified in the closing documents. And so we, that will be in the closing documents uh, that, that will be signed and we'll close in two weeks. Uh, section 5 just talks about the parameters. We're, we're within those parameters. Six, the accounts and funds, it just indicates that $650,000 would be in the tax exempt fund, $500,000 in the taxable. Again, for IRS purposes, we want to be clear on what money is which. Uh, section 7, it under the term sheet with the, the lender, uh, again, a very common provision. Should there be a default in payment, it provides a default rate of the outstanding rate plus 500 basis points, which is 5%. Okay. Um, common pr provision, and again, highly unlikely given the town's management and uh, the strength of its gross receipts tax. Section B just relates to a requirement that the lender wants to see audited financials annually and the budget. Nothing different than what you already are required that you are required to do under state statute and that you do do. Um, eight approves in the closing documents. Section nine just authorizes the sale. Section 10 just says the bond ordinance, which is the controlling document in conjunction with the sale resolution, should there be a conflict, which I'm not aware of one, um, the bond ordinance would, would supersede. However, the pricing terms are only in the sale resolution. There will be no changing of these pricing terms. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, uh, we're very happy with the result, um, and it would close by... Uh, July 22nd, and the money will be available at that time in, in the, in the uh, town's hands. Councilor Madison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to remind um, our residents um, that this uh, bond, um, which is uh, going to be paid from the um, state share of gross receipts tax, there's no new tax that will pay off these two bond series notes. No, but uh, the only thing that we have, we have a code rate that is dedicated is the current um, state gross receipts that have been adopted since 1985. So okay. they've been in place. Thank you, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that there's no new tax associated with these bonds. 
and that um, these series, these two series notes, and that um, in terms of the two uh, revenue note categories, that the actual projects that are to be funded by this total 1.1 1 .1, um, 1 million 150 thousand dollars includes our police vehicles, purchase of new vehicles. It's police vehicles, the EMS vehicles. Uh, the swimming pool liner and we might be able to do some additional work to the swimming pool for, for the youth um, and as well as the clubhouse at the golf course and the concession stand at Scott Park and with, with bathrooms. Thank you, Mr. President. Any other questions? Councilor Ray, did you have any questions? No, sir. Thank you. Uh, can I add uh, one last question? Mr. Brown. You want to put budget, budget, budget to $180,000 for debt service, so this is well within what we budgeted. So it's already in the preliminary budget. Okay, so we'll be able to amend it down. I'll entertain a motion. Okay. Councilor Bredesen. Ms. Mayor. I move to approve resolution number 2014-23 relating to the town of Silver City, New Mexico gross receipts tax improvement revenue bond revenue notes series 2014 to be issued in the aggregate principal amount of $1,150,000 consisting of two series, one $650,000 gross receipts tax improvement revenue notes series 2014-A tax exempt and two, $500,000 gross receipts tax improvement revenue notes, series 2014B, taxable, establishing the exact aggregate principal amount, maturity dates, rates of interest, redemption features, and price with respect to each series of notes in accordance with the town ordinance number 1228 adopted on June 9th, 2014, approving documents relating to the notes and ratifying action previously taken in connection therewith and repealing all action inconsistent with this revolution, re resolution <laughs> and amending on page 4 section 4D um, the second paragraph sixth sentence down uh, removing of blank percentage so that it would now read to a spread in effect at the time of prepayment as determined by a purchaser. As identified in the closing documents. As identified in the, in adding, as identified in the closing documents. Councilor Raymond Smith. I'll second as stated in the record. We have a motion and a second as read into the record. Is there any further discussion? We have a motion and a second as read into the record. Um, all those in favor or roll call? Uh, roll call. Councillor Bettison? Aye. Councillor Amos? Aye. Councillor Ray? Aye. Councillor Ricardo? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval disapproval of an agreement between the Town of Silver City and Local 2430 International Association of Fire Workers, AFL CIO, July 1st, 2014 to June 30, 2018. Mr. Brown. Myself and the town staff, the fire staff, uh, sat down and met with uh, the fire union a few weeks ago. And um, in front of you, what you have is a summary of the changes that were recommended uh, by uh, uh, the, the union as well as uh, staff. And some of the, the primary changes, most of it was all just uh, clarifying, cl clarifying clarifying the wording in the contract so it, it said what it really the intent of the contract was uh, a couple new things are uh, it provides for the opportunity for the firefighters to try a new schedule um, uh, the 
It is a four-year contract. Uh, we will be opening negotiations in April for um, for monetary every uh, April for monetary matters and anything identified by the Labor Management Committee. And, and, I, and I do want to commend uh, the the current management and and the union uh, because they worked hand in hand through the Labor Management Committee to get most of this work done before we actually entered into negotiations. So when we, when we sat down for negotiations, I didn't even have to be a part of it until the last half hour, 45 minutes. So, so they, they worked most of it out, and then, and then I just came back and said that there's no money. And I said, okay. <laughs> but but it was, it was, uh, everybody understands the financial situation because of the promise and, and but we do want to provide for opportunity to to do additional things throughout the, the, the term of the contract. Any questions for Mr. Brown? No, Councilor Ray, did you have any questions? No, sir. I'll entertain a motion. Councilor Connor? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I make a motion to approve of an agreement between the Town of Silver City and Local 2430 International Association of Firefighters, AFL CIO, July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2018. Mr. Mayor, I'll second that. We have a motion and a second for approval of agreement between Town of Silver City and Local 2430 International Association of Firefighters, AFL-CIO, July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2018. Is there any further discussion? Yes, yes. No, sir. We have a motion and a second as read. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda under unfinished business is approval disapproval of ordinance number 1231 an ordinance amending chapter 40 solid waste article 2 litter control of the town of silver city municipal code by adding a new section 40-27 reduction of single use plastic carry out bags uh, sponsor is uh, councillor bettison um councillor bettison thank you mr mayor um, as I mentioned um, on uh, May 27th when uh, the NOI for this ordinance was um, introduced, um, the ordinance is considered necessary for the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the town of Silver City for um, a number of reasons that I will um, go through in just a, in a, a minute or so. Before doing so, I want to mention that I wholeheartedly support this ordinance as um, I have sponsored it. In the six weeks since this ordinance was introduced, and all four pages were of it were available on the town's website for viewing and comment by the public, I received overwhelming support, both through emails, voicemails, and phone calls, and people that touch base with me um, at various different events or if I'm shopping. Uh, support in and for the ordinance from co commercial retailers slash merchants. Um, and town of Silver City residents alike. And I want to stress town of Silver City residents because I am a counselor of the town of Silver City. And this is an ordinance um, that is for the benefit of our citizens and residents. Um, in sum, as a sponsor of this bill, as of just before 6 o'clock when uh, this meeting started, I have received directly via email or phone call only four negative comments from town of Silver City residents. This ordinance as written will eliminate litter upon both public and private land, significantly reduce the unsightly appearance of the town to the continuing redistribution of litter by wind action. And the predominant thing that moves around through wind action are single use, carry out plastic bags. Beautify and enhance our environment for both residents and visitors, thereby mitigating the negative effect the proliferation of plastic bag litter has on the residents of the town and the detrimental effect on tourism, um, which results in negative economic consequences both for the town and its inhabitants. It will also reduce deposits at the landfill, enabling the landfill to avoid fines 
for the plastic bag litter, which will result in increased landfill, could result in increased landfill feeds for both town residences, residents and businesses and others who use the landfill. I mentioned during the introduction of this notice of intent that this ordinance is modeled after a number of municipalities that have enacted similar legislation, but that we actually selected the most reasonable and optimal regulations from those, discarding those items that were not optimal or really that we couldn't make our own that really had to do with um, the town of Silver City. The Office of Sustainability had contacted major retail establishments over a six month period prior to the introduction and all um, those retailers stated that they were on board since many are already conforming to similar ordinances in other municipalities in the southwest. There was a concern expressed by one of our major retail establishment folks who after more discussion about the ordinance and presentation by Office of Sustainability staff um, concurred with the legislation proposed since their establishment is still primarily set up for um, the use of paper bags, which um, is, is a good thing. I also mentioned that while a business trip in Seattle, I was stunned to find that these single use, and I'm going to pull one out, excuse me. My apologies to the uh, merchants who are on these bags. But I mean, I couldn't find one that didn't have names on it. So this is what we're talking about. That these single use carry out plastic bags were relegated to the trash bin. You had to throw them in the trash. And not the recycle bin like so many of us do here. There's no other method for them. I also said that I myself have reused these single-use plastic bags for a variety of reason, uh, reasons, um, uses including um, removing dog, yeah, leftovers or, you know, excretions. And now I understand, yeah, I'm trying to think of a really nice way to say that. Um, and now I understand that my reuse of these single-use plastic bags in this manner and in other manners has contributed to the major issues facing our landfill that Mr. Brown can speak to, potential fines that we're facing, and to the litter that's seen throughout the town. Because these are only intended for single use, and I can tell you that the two I'm holding up, like others that very few that I have left because I have been not I've been using my plastic bags that are made out of plastic bottles that I can reuse and cloth bags um, that they all have holes in them because they're only intended for one use. So this ordinance defines what a single use plastic carryout bag is, voila, what a reusable bag is. This is one, a crumple. What the definition of a recyclable paper bag is. It defines what a retail establishment and a person, what those um, are. And the, it also lists the bags that are excluded from this ordinance. It's very, very specific. The ordinance calls for retail establishments to provide the following bag types at checkout. Reusable bags, recyclable paper, um, bags and or cardboard boxes and I just want to make sure that folks understand that a recycled paper bag means a paper bag that either contains a minimum average of 40% post-consumer recycled paper content or is certified by either the Forest Stewardship Council or Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Also this ordinance if approved by the council today will not go into effect for six months, giving time for retail establishments to uh, use up their single-use carry-out plastic bag stock and to change over to the bag types listed as um, to, to uh, so that citizens can use those at the bag types. 
And it was also mentioned on May 27th um, that the town will carry out an educational, camp educational campaign for residents, residents, I keep saying residences, residents, um, and those shopping in Silver City. And um, we will be making available free reusable cloth bags. That this money's already been allotted for that. Um, the Office of Sustainability can answer any questions that people have, um, and um, you know who are from out of town that don't understand about the plastic bags. And um, I know there was something else that I really thought was important to say, and I didn't write it down. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. This doesn't work well at this point in the meeting. Um, I think it's really um, it's really important for us to remember that um, in the long run, this is going to beautify our town. It's going to ensure that not only our residents um, but our visitors to the town enjoy themselves when they're here. Because, um, as people have mentioned to me, I really love the people here, but the entrance. In and out, in the town or out of town, you know, it's clustered with, um, you know, the New Mexico flag, as had been mentioned before. You know, so within town, there's quite a bit of litter. I mean, it's not like we have winds that uh, we can control, given especially what acting fire chief just said. You know, the winds come up when cells, thunderstorm cells come through, and and um, so if they're in the land, if they've been put in the trash. If they have been reused, they will be lifted up at the landfill. Um, so um, I am, uh, as I said, I am the sponsor of this. I, I think that uh, the fact that there's been six weeks for um, the public to review and for other folks to review, that there's been um, ample time for comment, and uh, that uh, I would like to um, make a motion that can then, after, if it's uh, seconded, then discussion can ensue from everyone else. So, I move to approve ordinance number 1231 and ordinance amending chapter 40 solid waste article 2 litter control of the town of Silver City Municipal Code by adding a new section 40-27 reduction of single use plastic carryout bags. I'd like to second the motion. We have a motion and a second to approve of ordinance number 1231, ordinance amending chapter 40, solid waste, article 2, litter control of the Town of Silver City Municipal Code by adding a new section 40-27, reduction of single-use plastic carry-out bags. Um, any further discussion from council? Council Bessie? Yes, sir. Uh, Go ahead, then. Councilor Ray. Yes, sir. Can I third it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying no, no, no. no. Okay. Councilor Benson. Uh, thank you, Councilor Ray. Actually, um, if I could ask um, the town manager to talk about the issues that we have at the landfill with the uh, plastic bags and um, the concerns that have been raised recently in, I can't remember the name you told me, of what you're going through right now at the landfill. Um, uh, the over the years that I've been associated with the landfill um, and has been the, the chair of the authority, uh, we've we've encountered many many different times when the enforcement officials from the Solid Waste Bureau have come down and have had very specific issues with the cleanliness of the of the the landfill and and the majority of the cause are these plastic bags that are flying off off the authority uh, property uh, so as of right now we're probably about two-thirds way through the permitting process and one of the major points of contention is how are we going to control this blowing litter? And, and, and the majority of the blowing litter are these bags that end up... It's, it's not just the small things that blow 
because of the, the, the wind pushing it on the ground. It's because these bags get left like a little kite and they fly off of, off of the land, off of the property. So that, that's the primary problems, issues that we have out there and then they get stuck, they get stuck entangled in, in, in the bushes and it's hard to clean them and you know so we've had to actually, actually um, this year we contracted with uh, JPO to um, get some extra help um, catching up with uh, the site cleanup uh, now during the spring season, during the windy season you know it's not such, such a huge issue when it's not windy because there's not that lift that they get and they fly off the off site but that's that's the majority of the problems that they have over there Mr. Um, so did we did the landfill recently have to hire someone to clean yes we, we have regular staff to clean all the time but we they hired JPPO uh, to to go on site and and help clean um, the property right outside the boundaries of the of the um, of the landfill to to help uh, clean up a lot of it that that um, we just they just couldn't keep up with with regular staff. And then, um, I mean, this is really to ensure that we get our permit yeah. renewed. So it's really to facilitate that the cleanup and the extra help. Although current staff are working as best they can to to kind of keep it down. Um, so, and, um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want, there is, I just remember the comment I was going to make. As a professional investor archaeologist that has worked in the desert southwest since 1980, I can tell you that these plastic bags do not degrade, and they don't degrade rapidly. And I have been on archaeological sites in this area, on private property, I have been on archaeological sites in Nevada, worked on them there, eastern side of New Mexico, uh, northern part of New Mexico, west central New Mexico, east central Arizona. I could go for a really, really long list. And this even happens in Peru, where I also work as an archaeologist. We find them in the archaeological sites. We can actually date the deposition somewhat because we know that the looters have been in at a certain time because there's plastic bags in there. But um, the fact is, is on the site surface, they don't degrade. And the thing about paper bags is they are recyclable. They can be turned into recyclable paper bags. Cloth bags, you can use them until they wear out. And I would recommend that you um, definitely wash them. Um, and uh, I do that. And then the ones that are actually made, like the one that I showed earlier, out of recycled um, uh, uh, plastic bottles, can also be then recycled again. And uh, the last thing that I do want to mention is since um, six weeks ago when I introduced this, I have been mindful of making sure that I bring my reusable bags with me. And the metal things that currently hold the plastic bags in the retail establishments that I have frequented, the checkers at those establishments actually take the handle of the bags that I provide, of my cloth bags or uh, plastic, these uh, heavy duty plastic bags, and you actually tie it around the middle metal thing to hold it in place while they put the groceries in as they would a paper bag. And I just want to mention that no one has, none of those uh, checkout employees um, who shall remain nameless um, have ever um, been upset about the bag um, that I've provided or, you know, except for say, you sure they can all fit in here? Yeah, they can all fit in here. Yes, I can carry it out. Um, but many of them have said that they are thankful that they don't have to deal with the plastic bags anymore if this passes because they find them difficult to deal with as at the checkout stand. So 
that's right now the end of my comments. Thank you, Mayor. And just quickly before I turn it to Councilor Cano, just to reiterate and, and maybe get some clarification from Mr. Brown. We have increasing staffing cost, and if I'm not mistaken, potential for um, fines because of the, these bags. And if that is the case, if these costs do grow and we do not pass this ordinance, we are going to have more costs that are going to have to flow down to all our, our citizens and our businesses that they're going to have to recoup in some sort of fee, fine, tax increase by the town, which is, which is a cost that's probably going to be unbearable and unpalatable to our, business, our local businesses. Is that uh, relatively close? Yes, sir. It, it, it is relatively close. Going back to that, that issue with the permit renewal, um, the problem that we're having right now with the sticking point there is trying to find a cost-effective way of, of, of catching that, those bags once they start flying. Um, you know, they want us to put, us, put up those really big wind fences, but even still that doesn't work. Um, so uh, they want us to put some type of fencing up on the cell itself and the wind fencing. And the more and more we have to do in that type of activity means there's more and more that the landfill is going to have to pass on that cost to the consumer. The consumer. And then ultimately our businesses and our res residents. Um, Councilor Cano. I, I just want to make sure that you give me a chance to speak after the, the public speaks because I have a few things to say, but I'd like to hear what they have to say first. Any other council comments? I'm going to turn it over to the public. Uh, we'll open it up to any public member who wants to speak, but I'm going to start with this uh, this list. They put themselves in line, and I'll, I'll honor that. So, uh, uh, Ski, Szymanski. This is pretty cool to be up here and intimate with you all. So. <laughs> um, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. My name is Walter Shemansky, and I am a resident of the town of Silver City. And I speak to you this evening in support of the ordinance that Councilor Bettison introduced a little over six weeks ago. I su support this approach for a number of reasons, including that a vast majority of these type bags are not recycled, but are thrown away into our landfill or wind up in our trees, cactuses, and storm sewers. Many communities across the country have also decided to limit the use of single-use single use plastic carryout bags, and I think the record is clear that as a result, those communities are the healthier for it. Some decry this kind of policy making as nanny style government trying to force changes in consumer behavior. In response, I say, so what? <laughs> that is a critical part of what government does. For example, smoking bans, cigarette taxes, and clean indoor air acts oblige people to change their behaviors. All of those things were initially and loudly denounced by some, but the benefits to individuals and to society brought about by those policy decisions far outweigh the inconvenience that accompanied them. There has been ample time over the past six weeks for everyone to think about and discuss this proposed public policy. For me, Ordinance 1231 seems like a common sense approach that should serve to lessen the negative effects on our community of a major source of a non-biodegradable litter, while at the same time advancing the town's admirable environmental policy. For the reasons articulated in Ordinance 1231, I see this as a plus in the town's balance sheet, and I thank Councilor Bettison for sponsoring this proposed legislation. I would like to close by saying, as others have noted, that we humans have lived for thousands of years without single-use plastic bags, <laughs> and, I think, and I think we'll not only be just fine without them once this ordinance goes into effect, 
but the better for it in the long run. I urge the town councilors and the mayor to support Ordinance 1231. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And I will remind uh, people, we we want to make sure that the, the evidence and the support is... Um, is additional and, and, and cumulative and adds to the discussion. Hopefully we're not going to regurgitate a lot of the same comments. Um, Jane Regis? Rebecca Summer? Uh, Linda Smith? Councilors and Mayor, I'm really glad to be here tonight. I'm, I'm actually very thrilled to say that I'm here to support Ordinance Number 1230. I have um, seen this as a huge need for Silver City since I moved here in 2009. Um, this landscape is too beautiful to be littered by irresponsible throwing away of plastic bags. Whether the issue began as a lack of education or for whatever reasons it's just easy to let them fly, um, it's created kind of a monster in a really beautiful community. So <clears throat> I just wanted, if you had any doubts about some reasons to do this, I just wanted to share a few factoids with you that I think might support the case. The amount of plastic produced between the year 2000 and 2010 exceeds the amount produced during the entire last century. Up to 80% of the plastic in our oceans comes from land-based sources, so the problems from marine life don't just happen along the coastlines. In 2009, 3.8 million tons of waste plastic bag sacks and wraps were generated in the United States with a recycling percentage of 9.4%. They're just not being recycled. And towns that have tried to do partial bans, it really hasn't worked out for that reason. Cleanup of plastic bags is extremely costly, as we've heard already tonight. California spends $25 million annually in order to landfill discarded plastic bags, and public agencies spend more than $300 million annually in litter cleanup. Americans go through about 100 billion plastic bags a year or 360 bags per year for every man, woman, and child in this country. Plastics made from petroleum, which is a non-renewable resource. Plastic bags are not biodegradable. They break into smaller particles, which never fully disappear. And plastic bags make up a major part of the waste in our landfills. We live in a wonderful place. I applaud you for bringing this ordinance to the forefront in Silver City and um, I'm just here to have my support. Thank you. Thank you. Azima. All the things I was going to say have been said, so pass it. <laughs> <laughs> Alan. Good evening. I'm Alan Mong, a resident of Silver City. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Um, I live over on the east side of Ursa Major and walk up on that ridge frequently, as many of my neighbors do with their dogs every morning. And as you know in years past, Mayor and Councilor, that I've been to the uh, Council before about the trash on the ridge up there. The majority of the trash is in plastic bags, uh, well, diapers, all kinds of things. It's just easy to toss, and it still goes on. And of course, what happens? And the you know the stuff comes out of the bags. The bags are in the trees during the windy season. I usually have a bag and a tree or cactus in my yard every day. I come to tell you about cloth bags. I have six of them here that I can loop on my fingers, I can loop on my arms. I know there's a lot of concern for citizens in our town that may not be able to afford 
Oh, thanks. I want to tell you again that at the food pantry, at the end of last year, we started telling people that we were going to switch to cloth bags to please bring them. We were getting some donated from several organizations. Well, the Volunteer Center actually gave them out, gave them out. And the response was great. Within a couple of months, people were saying, oh, yeah, I've got my. So, you know, everybody was really excited. And I would say by now, that 85% of the food pantry recipients have cloth bags. Also, additionally, I want to let you know that I've told all my friends in church about this, and everybody's excited about it, and I want to take it upon my own uh, doing to collect bags from all my friends who probably have 20 bags in a, a bedroom like I do. And also, they would like to volunteer. Let's go out to Walmart and pass out cloth bags to people. So. I have found tremendous support for that. And uh, I, I tell the citizens that are concerned not to worry. There will, there will be plenty of cloth bags for everyone. So please approve Ordinance 1231. Thank you. Gordon, West. Hi, I'm Gordon West. I'm here representing the Green Chamber of Commerce and myself. And in full disclosure, I need to tell you that my daughter is a chemical engineer who works for Weyerhaeuser at a plant that makes craft paper. <coughs> but <laughs> even she doesn't uh, support plastic bags or paper bags. She uses reusable bags. Uh, one other comment is... Um, We've not really talked about economic development directly, but um, I actually believe this getting rid of the, the bag litter will have quite an effect on tourism. It's a little bit like if you're going to sell your truck, you, you probably clean it up first, and it'll sell easier. You might get more money. Or if you're going to sell your house, you do the same thing. So let's uh, clean up the community, and maybe it'll sell better. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Scott, okay. My name is Scott Terry. I'm with the Silver City Grant County Chamber of Commerce. You know, we really don't oppose this, and I think it has some very, very good merits. Uh, you know, I've seen lots of studies on both sides that it is good to, to not have the, the plastic on landfills, just as I've also seen things about the cross-contamination of using reusable bags if you don't clean them well. Um, what, what I'm here tonight for really isn't for or against. I know everybody keeps talking about we had six weeks, but quite frankly, there's still businesses in this town that will be affected by this that don't even know this conversation is going on tonight. Um, I know that Terry had went out and to a sampling of businesses some time back, and they really didn't get a clear picture as to when this was going to happen. And quite frankly, there's a lot of the folks don't even realize that if they had that conversation, that they did, that they don't remember a conversation about going to this plastic ban. What we would like to do is, is just have the opportunity for businesses to visit with you folks, visit with the the uh, Office of Sustainability employees and talk about their concerns and talk about why you want to do this. And I guess what you might say, it would be an education program for the business community. You know, I've heard some great, or some really, really great ideas from some of our local businesses how they would like to participate in community education of using re reusable or using plastic. You've probably not heard that because you've not had those meetings with those people. Well, we would like to ask that you postpone your yes vote or no vote for 30 days, just long enough to have a couple of meetings with businesses and with some of you and your Office of Sustainability to educate them on why you want to do this and let them talk about what is going to happen for their businesses. You know, the Bells, uh, which is part of the Stages Corporation, uh, they're looking at quadrupling their cost on going to, from plastic to paper. Will they do it? Absolutely they will. But they just would kind of like to let you know that. 
Why are there not more business people here? Corporate business doesn't allow their local managers to speak on behalf of corporations. I'm sure each one of you would be aware of that. You won't see the Walmart guy here, the Albertsons gentleman. You won't see Radio Shack. You won't see those guys who work for corporate America because they're told that they cannot comment. So I guess you might say that uh, through the conversations that I've had with several of them over the last week and a half, I'm commenting for them. They're not against it. They just would like to learn more about it. They would like that opportunity to meet with you and to meet with your Office of Sustainability. Like I said, I think you'd be surprised at some of the ideas that they have and some of the things that they would like to do to help you with a community-wide education program. Uh, do I think you're going to postpone it? Probably not. I think you're going to approve it? Probably so. But the fact is, these folks really would like the opportunity to talk to you. The holiday hit us in a bad point. It really cut back on how many days we had to try to have meetings. Mayor was on vacation. Alex was out of town on work. It just, uh, the timing was bad. And uh, I'm not sure that waiting 30 days to pass this is really going to make a huge amount of difference. You're going to cause us to go into a lot of different fines uh, out there. Uh, I think you'll find that some of the business community has some very good ideas about how maybe you can work on, on the problems out at the landfill and at the recycling center. Giving them the opportunity to speak with you I think will be a very good advantage for this community. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Scott. That's the list on those who signed up, but uh, would anybody else like to speak? Shall we? I applaud the new arrangement. Um, Shelby Hallmark, uh, Silver City citizen. Uh, I just want to add three things to the conversation you've heard so far. One is with respect to the time frame for these, this discussion. Uh, I was on the mayor's climate uh, committee um, a few years ago, and uh, a plastic ban uh, was one of the recommendations of the uh, of the climate committee uh, that was approved by the town council. I believe it was in 2009. Uh, so the idea is not being sprung at the last minute. Uh, the Climate Committee, before it disbanded uh, a year or two ago, uh, proposed to, to bring that up because it was one of the few recommendations of that group that hadn't been acted upon. Uh, but we finally decided that it was probably best uh, to turn that matter over to the Recycling Advisory Committee because that was, it, that was where it, you know, was the subject matter was most appropriately uh, dealt with. But before we did that, we did do outreach to uh, uh, community uh, uh, commercial entities uh, uh, with respect to a proposed ordinance that we, uh, that Linda Smith, as a matter of fact, uh, um, researched from other towns. So the idea has been uh, abroad for a long time. Two, uh, the second point is I think there's a real value to doing this uh, because it'll, it, 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 in, it engages the entire community, uh, all, everybody who shops, uh, in the notion of how can I improve the environment and the, the, the uh, appearance of my town. I think that's a solidarity, that's a community strengthening activity, even for those of us who are going to bitch about it, which will include me because I forget my bag sometimes. But it's, <laughs> but it's something that I think it, 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 it sort of requires that we all pull together. That's a good thing. And the third thing is, I think it's a real brand issue for Silver City to be to join the group of uh, enlightened towns all around the country that have already done this. Uh, and there's hundreds of them. Uh, we researched that in the committee. I, I can't list them all to you, but I can tell you that uh, that one that I thought was particularly apt for uh, for Silver City was Brownsville, Texas, which most people won't think is. Uh, you know, a left-leaning uh, coastal kind of town. It is coastal, but uh, left-leaning, no. Uh, but they have done this two or three years ago. Uh, when I talked with them, they were happy about the way it was being implemented. It's a good thing to do. Thank you very much. I hope you vote for it. Allison? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> 
Good evening, Mayor Moronis and Council Members. I'm Allison Civic, Executive Director of Healer Resources Information Project, and we work to uh, promote community health by protecting our environment and natural resources here in southwestern New Mexico. And GRIP supports Ordinance 1231 to ban single-use plastic bags from retail establishments, and as Shelby just said, there are more than 200 municipalities across the country. I was a founding member of the Climate Action uh, uh, Committee, and I'm just so pleased that that this uh, policy is here before you tonight. And I, I do want to tell you, give you um, some additional facts. Uh, there was a report, a study that was done by the Equinox Center in California that looked at some of the economics and environmental impacts of plastic bag bans in um, municipalities in. California and uh, some pretty uh, huge numbers. So uh, for the cities of San Jose and Santa Monica as well as the county of Los Angeles uh, after implementing a plastic bag ban they in those communities they uh, realized a 75% reduction in plastic bags. So what uh, what did they see in place of these plastic bags? Well 22, there was a 22% increase in uh, people not using any bags. So uh, people who just walked away carrying their item, 22% uh, increase, people didn't take any kind of bag. 40% increase in reusable plastic bags. Paper bag use increased by only 13%. So, uh, you know, it's not really this sort of one, one, uh, one to one relationship. Uh, you get rid of plastic bags and, um, you know, you see a, an increase in the, um, paper bag use. Uh, in terms of sh uh, economic impact or financial impact on retailers in uh, uh, businesses in these communities, San Jose, Los Angeles, and, and Santa Monica, um, they did see some short-term increase in baggage costs due to increased paper bag use. However, these costs were mitigated over time um, as consumers transition to uh, reusable bag. So uh, San Jose, San Francisco, which was the first community in the country to in institute a plastic bag ban, reported no sustained negative impact to retailers over time as this transition takes place. So um, I, I want to thank you for uh, Councillor Bettison for bringing this uh, ordinance um, uh, here for consideration and I encourage you all to support um, ordinance 1231. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, drop that down. Um, I'd like to introduce ourselves. We're William and Elizabeth Lloyd. We are both uh, citizens of Silver City, business owners, a corporation, small one, um, and we strongly support, we're also property owners, and we strongly support this ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to speak on three things that have been brought up here this evening. First of all, I'd like to bring up that uh, the foodborne illnesses possibly being transmitted. I realize that might be a risk. I've been carrying cloth bags for 27 years and have never had an issue. I'd like to say that. The second thing I would like to bring up on that, that as a business, we do and have used always in our business paper bags, and it has never been a problem absorbing that cost. So I don't think, I do think time-wise, that six months is adequate time for business to change that over. And the third thing that I wanted to bring up is uh, we are members of Cirque Rider Foundation. It is an international organization dedicated to protecting our oceans and beaches and the public's access to them. We were instrumental on South Padre Island and attended the town council meeting there. We followed a year after Brownsville, Texas, um, which we were shocked and pleasantly surprised and neither of the communities have had any issues in implementing them. I have to say that when we moved to South Padre Island, um, when we went to Brownsville, we went to Walmart and when we walked, we pulled into the Walmart parking lot and the bar walk, the, being that close to the border, it was a, it would look like the, the landfill. It was just full of trash and bags and boxes and the people would come over um, from Mexico and they would buy stuff and they couldn't take it back so they would just put it there. Well when they implemented the bag ban and I think that not only did it um, 
did it stop the plastic bags from being out there, but it made everybody more mindful of the trash that was everywhere. And now if you go to Brownsville and you drive into that Walmart, it's not like that. It looks like it's nice. So I think that it made a difference not only in the plastic bags themselves, but in how people think about trash and about what they are, about the trash they are creating all over. Thank you. Thank you. Sissy. Hello, Mayor, Council, staff, and community. I'm here tonight on behalf of myself as a citizen of Silver City. And I bring to you my companion for the last 20 years. This is one of the four bags that I have that I purchased. Uh, it was actually made in Salt Lake City and uh, in a year uh, you know I may not be able to get my cents back anymore when I go to the store after January 1st but I think this would also be a great cottage industry here uh, people making bags for sale. I think we've heard that there are people that are willing to contribute bags. Uh, I think it's just a matter of common sense. And the other thing is comfort. I see some people walking and they've got a lot of the plastic bags and they're probably just about cutting the circulation off. And Alan did a great job showing us uh, how the bags can be worn. Uh, but the nice thing about this is it does change shape. The handles are very comfortable. So again, as a health issue, I think these are much more comfortable. And I think that uh, this is an ordinance that's time to be supported tonight. And that six months is more than enough time for it to be implemented. Thank you. A short one. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Honorable Councilors, Mr. Brown. Um, my name is Kathy Anderson. I'm president of the Silver City Neighborhood Alliance and I'm speaking on behalf of them and um, against the issues of increased crime and blight. There are, as we probably will remember, numerous variations of the theory that originated uh, with the term broken windows theory. Under that theory, communities uh, learned after many years of social science research that neighborhoods that allow trash to collect tend to have crime, higher crime rates. Um, we have, as one of our programs, the Graffiti Gong of volunteers. Those folks will be present in the Big Ditch Park for the party next weekend and will be uh, cleaning up graffiti and picking up plastic bags. Um, I have been down there many times photographing graffiti and find plastic bags with all manner of assortments of, of things in them. And um, I can only encourage uh, some of the other nonprofits that are here to create opportunities for uh, cloth and reusable bags to be used by the homeless so that they will take those bags with them when they leave the Big Dutch Park. Um, in the neighborhoods that tend to have more graffiti, we see more plastic bags. Um, I think that's the point well enough said. I'd like to add a personal note. Um, I've been a resident of the ETJ and not the town of Silver City for nearly 10 years. Out in the ETJ, we tend to see what the wind brings, and it brings a lot of plastic bags. It sticks in the telephone lines, it sticks in the trees, it sticks in the, in the cactus, and they're very hard to retrieve. Uh, from a personal note, again, um, I am thinking of this ordinance as, as the Sally Stewart ordinance. Sally Stewart was a resident of Silver City until she passed uh, three years ago and lived out off Ridge Road and got to personally experience the plastic bags on their way to the landfill that never made it. Um, Sally Stewart and I first met downtown when I saw her carrying a cloth reusable bag identical to one that I had purchased in Australia in 1998. The entire country of Australia outlawed these disposable plastic bags 15 years ago. I'm glad to see us catching up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, commenters? 
Council Cano? Um, over the past, it's been six weeks now, uh, I've been doing a little bit of my own personal research. As many of you know, I started out about a year ago slightly disabled, and then I became more disabled, and now I'm in a wheelchair. And while that's not a, temp a permanent thing, I've learned a lot about the needs of the disabled in this town. <laughs> and um, I would just be really, really, um, that's what I'm looking for, pleased, I guess, with the Office of Sustainability if they would think about the needs of the disabled when you do that educational program. Sorry, I'm not so emotional about this. You need to include poor people, disabled people, Hispanic people, and people who are locals who have lived here their entire lives. None of those people were represented today. Okay? Those people need to come sit at the table before you do the educational process. If you're willing to do that, then I'm willing to support this. Thank you. Any further comments? Um, just a basic comment, uh, just a somewhat of a summary as, as well. We, uh, when we brought this forward six weeks ago, and I've been, you know, I, I'm always an advocate for communicating and, and wanting to make sure that, that, we, that we hit stakeholders and, and, and make sure that everybody gets um, a voice. But there is the there is a counter side to that. Uh, you know, the processes that we have to use, the, the 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 notices of intent, the legal notices, um, and, and those procedures are are there for a reason to educate the public who is supposed to take ownership in their own responsibility and know what their government is doing and make their comments and make their uh, their voices heard so so six weeks i apologize for that Let me see. six weeks ago there was legal notice there was a notice of intent there was articles in two papers that are that are well read and from that there was a number of individuals who found out what we were doing. There were a lot of stakeholders who represent individuals, including businesses. They did a lot of due diligence. They saw what we were doing. And six weeks ago, we're already giving comment. And interestingly enough, and, and it has kind of been reiterated here, and it kind of mimics what we've heard here, is a huge amount of support for this, this, uh, this issue. So for the last six weeks, a huge body of individuals have come out in support, both consumers and businesses. So we, you know, we we've done our our we we've done our open and transparent um, acts that we're supposed to, and we've seen that a huge body of our residents have taken the due diligence to read, educate, and, and form their opinions. Um, it's only four pages. Um, I can't say I've memorized all four pages, but we were all aware and we all had read those four pages six weeks ago. And a number of those people who have commented read all four pages. It's fairly plain language. It, it's, it's not, uh, it is a little legalese, so it, it's not uh, perfectly clear, but uh, Plenty of time to educate yourself, make comments, and, and make presentations. If this is passed, there is six months of education and ability to transition. Part of that six months of, of education is further opportunity for every stakeholder group to come and articulate, to find out how staff is going to interpret this policy and put it into procedure. How is it going to be interpreted? How is it going to be put in place? Um, how are we going to get from this policy to the procedures being done six months from now? And 
that that is a tremendous body of of uh, of time especially in light of what was said you know this idea was um uh, was supported was brought forward and supported in 2009 from a from a theoretical standpoint it it has been entertained over the last couple of years and it has been um uh looked upon with a, a number not not a hundred percent we 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 use samples because that's practical uh but talk to a number of businesses and and um solicited ideas and thoughts and 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 gave a tremendous amount of forewarning and we're not leaders here in all reality we're not leading the country we are following a huge body of cities in this regard and um may not be perfect uh, but we can definitely utilize what those other 200 plus communities have done in this next six months in helping us work out our our procedures on how to apply this this policy. Um, I do want to convey that uh, we we definitely want all businesses that that want a voice, all business groups who want a voice, all lower income individuals and disabled individuals. I, I, I hope that our staff and, and I encourage our staff and, and really strongly state that our staff needs to reach out and communicate with those individuals and make sure that the that this interim six months, if this passes, um, is, is well understood and known by our by our community. Um, you know, there, uh, a lot of companies. Uh, there was one specifically named. It was a um, one of those bells. Interestingly enough, we we may, we may want to even know if they're even part of this because there is a size of the plastic bag that is being banned. A lot of our retailers, especially clothing retailers and such, their bags are already larger than and more substantial than what's being banned here. So we have a number of retailers who may be concerned, who may be potentially even against and want uh, postponement, who aren't even going to be affected by this because their bags are already, um, they meet the requirements stated in this ordinance. In fact, uh, but Bell's being an example, I do believe that those are, and any bag like a Bell's bag already complies with what's being presented here and first being presented six weeks ago. Um, any other comments from the council before we, because we do have a motion, we do have a second that needs to be addressed before we can even consider anything like a postponement. Mm -hmm. Councilor Bettison. Mr. Mayor, I thank you for your comments and I thank everyone else um, for their comments. Um, one of the things that I would like to point out is it has been six weeks and generally speaking, um, when an NOI is introduced, we have to have a period of 15 days for comment. So, actually, I'm the one who requested postpone, postponement to the first meeting in July to add the additional weeks for comment. And the bulk of the comment I received actually happened six weeks ago. Some of it prior to the council even looking at have the council meeting because it had been published as an NOI into newspapers. So I appreciate everything everyone has said and I thank Councillor Kano for her comments because I too am disabled and have on occasion had to use um, various means to ensure my um, transportation and um, as I had mentioned uh, when I, uh, these are the same comments that I kind of said when I, you know, had done the introduction of the ordinance this weeks ago, I find it much easier for me if I, when I have to use crutches or a cane to actually use um, a reuse, reusable bag because um, I don't end up with everything broken on the concrete outside the retail establishment which has happened more times than I care to acknowledge here. Um, so um, I, I, um, I appreciate those comments because we will make sure that we work 
and that it's really critical that all of our citizens understand this, all of our residents, and that the town's education efforts um, and the Office of Sustainability Education efforts are very inclusive, as the mayor said. And we provide reusable bags, and that we find other venues um, that have been noted by some of the folks um, who spoke here tonight where they wanted to make sure that those were available. So thank you. Councilor Ray, do you have any comments? No, sir. I, I don't. I don't. Yes, yes I do. I do. Well, now we now young. My friend is at a grocery store, and he has nothing but paper bags. And he said there are groceries and paper bags and paper bags and in boxes. And people used to use the paper bags and they used to take them back to the grocery stores and they used to them again. So I don't see anything wrong with what council the council base is trying to do. Thank you. Okay. And for those who who didn't fully get that he, he was mentioning uh, bygone days which uh, were they he did use uh, paper bags and, and and boxes and in many cases uh, they worked well enough that they were reused at those at those same grocers uh, and such so uh, pretty decent comment Councillor Raymond Smith Last time, I thank all the folks from my district who emailed me. I only have one comment uh, where a person was concerned. Everyone else was a big thumbs up. And I want to remind you, you can get your historical free uh, cloth bag from the bin back there where the chief is standing. Mr. Brown. I just want to remind everybody, as Councillor uh, Medicine stated, we did uh, put... Uh, budget funds to purchase reusable bags that we're going to make available for free to the public at a whole that whole um, until they until they run out and um actually probably what, what i will do is um we're going to try to add some funding to the office of sustainability to get additional people out there so we can have additional outreach rather than just the few individuals that are working for the staff right now. Maybe help get additional outreach by using the university or or some other organizations like that to help us do that. So uh, to hopefully help with the council panel's uh, needs, I, I'd be uh, willing to work on trying to get something like that. Uh, and on a note of those, uh, those bags, uh, my... Uh, much more stereotypical penny pinching business partner who's really a stereotypical accountant he'll probably be showing up for some free bags ban him blacklist him um, give them to those who, who are who need it more <laughs> um, we have a motion and a second for approval of ordinance number 1231 an ordinance amending chapter 40 solid waste article 2 litter control of the town of silver city municipal code by adding a new section 40-27 reduction of single use plastic carry out bags roll call councilor benison aye councilor amos aye councilor ray councilor ray Councilor Ray, are you still there? Councilor Kana. Aye. Uh, Councilor, are you, I think that you can recess the vote to make contact with Councilor Ray. I will. So, do I need to make a motion to recess the vote? We just so try to. Let me try to call. Okay. Enjoy this Verizon ring back while you're part of the show. Counselor? Mayor. We, we, we are on a roll, roll call. We, we just announced the motion in the second. I, I did hear this and I did say aye, but I guess, I guess you couldn't hear me. Can you hear me now? We yes. can hear you now. Okay, I did say I, yes or I. 
Okay. Motion carries. Councilor Bedson. Mr. Mayor, um, it's unfortunate that time when I need to move for a short break. Uh, we have a motion and a second for a short break. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> We're in recess. I'll call this meeting back to order. Uh, next item on the agenda is approval of ordinance number 1232, an ordinance approving the execution of a memorandum of understanding, the effect of which creates a long-term lease of the Silco Theater to the Corporation for Downtown Development, doing business as Silver City Main Street. Uh, Mr. Brown. Actually, it's uh, Mr. Scavron. Uh, Mr. Scavron. Yes, um, at the, uh, at the uh, urging of uh, the mayor, and uh, in the original NOI, there was an attached MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, which is the way we do a long-term lease. And it was brought to our attention by Main Street that in the original negotiations, they wanted the option to purchase the Silco at, the, uh, at some point when all the... Uh, uh, debt service and all the money had been paid back to the town so that the town would basically sell the Silco if, if Main Street wanted to exercise the option after 15 years they could buy the Silco back and the money that they have paid in rent and their other uh, reimbursements of the town for the town's expenses would be applied towards the purchase price and the purchase price would be the higher of the contributions and rents that they've paid over the years or the appraised value. Under law, we cannot sell any town property for less than appraised value. And even though this option exists, it would still have to go through the town's ordinance that governs the sale of town-owned property. So that was uh, that option that to be given to Main Street has been added in a new paragraph 24. And along with that, a uh, concern by one of the counselors was, well, what happens if, if they exercise this option in 15 years and then they decide to resell it? So there's also in this paragraph uh, a right of first refusal so that if they do decide, if Main Street after, if they, if, there's a lot of ifs, if they exercise the option and if they can comply with A through F, which are the provisions uh, talking about how they would exercise this option, then we would have a right of first refusal. The town would have a right of first refusal, where, and that would exist for 10 years after Main Street would buy back the Silco. So if there was some reason that the town wanted this building, and in 15 years or 25 years, a future council said, you know, we want to take this building back. We don't want it being sold to a private party. That, that possibility exists. It's really hard to imagine what a future council might do in, 10, in 15 to 25 years from now, but this at least opens up some options. Main Street, I did talk to uh, uh, Ms. Whitmarsh. She's comfortable with the, the, uh, this concept. And uh, I did put it by uh, Councillor Ray, who is the sponsor of this legislation, and he's comfortable with it, to my understanding. So at this point, I think it's, uh, unless there's questions from the rest of the uh, lease is exactly the same as what was in the first NOI. The only thing that's been added is paragraph 24 covering the option to purchase with the manner of doing it and the right of first refusal reserved to the town. Any questions from the council? Any comments from the audience, from the public? 
Again, I'm Lucy Whitmarsh, and I'm the president of the board for the Silver City Main Street. And I would like to um, thank their town, thank, thank the town for offering us this opportunity, and also um, for working with us to develop this document. And uh, we certainly are in support of it. And we uh, do hope that this will ordinance will be passed. Thank you very much. <coughs> do you have any questions? For me? Are there any questions for Lucy? No. No, no. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Ray, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve order number 1232 and the ordinance approving the execution. I have a memorandum of understanding the effect of which creates a long term lease of the Circle Theater, a corporation for downtown development, CBA, Territory Main Street, with the amendment of MOA, which adds a new paragraph 24 entitled Option to Purchase Services and right of first receiver. And I would like to have Mr. Chairman read the amendment, if possible, please. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Ray, I'd be glad to accommodate you. Uh, the amendment is a new paragraph 24, which as the councilor mentioned, the title of is option to purchase premises and right of first refusal. The town grants to lessee the option to purchase the demise premises under the following circumstances and subject to the right of first refusal reserved by the town. A. All the underlying indebtedness to which the town is presently liable or may become liable with regard to the purchase, renovation, repair, and maintenance of the demise premises shall have been fully paid off along with all attendant costs, fees, interest, and penalties, if any. B. All contributions of capital made by the town to the demise premises shall have been reimbursed to the town. Such reimbursement may be paid concurrent with the closing uh, purchase of this purchase and sale transaction. C. The lessee shall have faithfully performed all its obligations created under this lease and under the purchase and sale agreement between the town and Silver City Main Street, now the lessor herein. D. The lessee shall agree to continue to operate the demised premises as a public venue for the arts. E. The rents and reimbursements paid by lessor, that should be lessee, to the town over the term of this lease shall be credited towards the purchase price of the demised premises. The purchase price shall be the greater of the appraised value or the combined sum of all rents and reimbursements paid to the town. F, the term of the option to purchase shall be coextensive with the term of this lease, including any extensions thereof. G, if SCM, which is Silver City Main Street, shall exercise its option to purchase the Silco property under the terms and conditions mentioned herein, the town does hereby and shall reserve a right of first refusal to repurchase the reference property. This right of first refusal shall extend for a period of 10 years from the date of such purchase by SCM. Accordingly, if SCM receives and accepts a bona fide offer to purchase the Silco property, it shall be subject to the town's right herein. SCM shall thereupon notify the town within 15 days thereof, and the town shall have 45 days 
to indicate its intention to exercise its right of first refusal to purchase under the same terms and conditions as agreed upon by SCM and the third party bona fide purchaser. H. All the rights and obligations mentioned herein shall survive closing the purchase of the mentioned property by SCM. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Mayor, I second the motion as stated by Councillor Ray and our Council Roberts. The we have a motion a second for approval of ordinance number 1232, an ordinance approving the execution of a memorandum of understanding, the effect of which creates a long term lease of the Silco Theater to the Corporation for Downtown Development, doing business as Silver City Main Street, with amendment to the MOU adding paragraph 24 entitled option to purchase premises and right of first refusal. Is there any further discussion? We have a motion a second for approval of ordinance number 1232, an ordinance approving the execution of memorandum of understanding, the effect of which creates a long term lease of the Silco Theater to the Corporation for Downtown Development, doing business as Silver City Main Street, with amendment to the MOU adding paragraph 24 entitled option to purchase premises and right to first refusal, which was read by our Councillor. Roll call. Councillor Cano. Aye. Councillor Ray. Aye. Councillor Amon Smith. Aye. Councillor Benison. Aye. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is approval, disapproval of ordinance number 1233, an ordinance amending chapter 52 utilities, article 3, water and sewer rates and charges, section 52-94A, water deposit, and section 52100, bill for illegally used services of the town of Silver City Municipal Code. Mr. Brown. Mr. Mayor, Councillor, basically what this ordinance does is it changes the deposit which is required when you're turning on the utility services to increase from $100 to $200 when you turn on the utilities. I do want to state that this isn't retroactive to any current customers. So this is only for future customers. Currently, the code does state that renters do not receive their refund of their deposit until their final bill. Current owners get the refund of their deposit after 12 months good credit. So those people that have the $100 deposit on a rental property, that will remain in effect. We will not go back and ask for an additional $100. On top of this, the only other change is the penalty for illegally using town services. And basically what we're doing is we would be charging the 300% of what the estimated cost of what they've taken. And that's basically been standard practice. It's just putting it in the code book. One thing that I do want to say that I did say previously is that the average bill is about $65 to $69. And this is for all services, not just water, but all water, sewer, and sanitation services. It's about $65. And once you get the way that we work things is that we do not turn your water off unless you're two and a half months late on your bill. And so when you get two and a half months at the average water bill, you're close to $200. So the intention of this is that the town does not subsidize people who are choosing to skip on their bill. We're trying to get away just like the gross receipts tax. We do not want to subsidize bad debt. 
uh, I, I was speaking to the mayor and, and uh, one of the counselors, I can't remember, Councilor Medicine earlier, and we were talking about that debt. And um, right now the, the town holds about uh, $360,000 worth of bad debt due to um, uh, bills that have been skipped out on. And this is since about 1998. So, we, so we're averaging about $20,000 of bad debt annually. Um, and, and this will help, again, hopefully alleviate part of that situation. <coughs> Just to, to add to that, uh, I'm the listed sponsor of this ordinance, and, and, and I do fully support it. Um, not only do we not want to subsidize bad debt, but we don't want to subsidize bad behavior. Uh, where what's creating the bad debt is bad behavior, normally people skipping out on, on their obligations. Um, there has been concerns uh, that I have heard and I empathize with is, uh, does this, even though it is a, a deposit nature that, that is still owned by the, uh, the person making that deposit, they, they may get it back if they own property or they may get it back when they uh, terminate their lease uh, as a renter. But one of the things that, that's, that helped make me comfortable in this regard is um, I, I have rentals, uh, in fact, 82 rentals. Um, and we incidentally have a lot of HUD residents and a lot of low income residents and I was wondering well how does it affect them well considering we pay for all their water they do they do not have those deposits um, they do not have that burden and even kind of thinking about it is is that because I'm a nice guy no not really it's because that's the it's, it's economics that drive it. It's the marketplace that drives it. We're trying to compete with many of the other uh, rental, uh, the apartment owners, um, who more times than not, there, there are exceptions, there's always exceptions, include water to their tenants. So those tenants and, and those, those units that have a lot of HUD tenants and, and lower income tenants, they're also not uh, having to come up with the extra burden in the future. Um, also, I'm a big fan of not making things retroactive. So those who are already in place, those on fixed incomes, the, the elderly, the Social Security uh, uh, individuals who are already in place, they've either received their, their uh, deposit back or they're in a position where they will not have to add to that uh, Deposit in the future because this is not retroactive. So I, I feel pretty comfortable with the with the uh, with the body of individuals who who have less wherewithal than than some of uh, those of us who do. Uh, we're we're not creating a tremendous burden on those individuals. Yet we are protecting the town, its citizens, its residents, uh, the 10,300 owners of our system of our utility system from having to subsidize bad behavior. And, and that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm a, a big fan of this ordinance and, and the sponsor. Are there any questions from the council for staff or myself? Yes, sir. I will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Raymond Smith. I move to approve ordinance number 1233. An ordinance amending Chapter 52, Utilities, Article 3, Water and Sewer Rates and Charges, Section 52-94A, Water Deposit, and Section 52-100, Bill for Illegally Used Services <coughs> of the Town of Silver City Municipal Code. Mr. Mayor, I second the motion stated. We have a motion and a second for approval of ordinance number 1233, an ordinance amending chapter 52, utilities, article 3, water and sewer rates and charges, section 52-94A, water deposit, and section 52-100, bill for illegally used services of the town of Silver City Municipal Code. Is there any further discussion? No, sir. No, sir. 
We have a motion a second for approval of ordinance number 1233 and ordinance amending chapter 52 utilities. Article 3, water and sewer rates and charges. Section 52-94A, water deposit. And section 52-100, bill for illegally used services of the town of Silver City Municipal Code. Roll call. Councilor Benson? Aye. Councilor Smith. Aye. Councilor Ray? Aye. Councilor Connor? Aye. Motion carries. Councilor Benson? Mr. Mayor, I move to adjourn. Councilor Smith. We have a motion and a second for adjournment. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Adjourned.